And by the way, how much is my patience worth to you? <laughs> right. <laughs> Do you want to start the heart sutra? Uh, we'll start recording. Okay. So, I if did. You, oh, you already did. Sorry. Okay, so I can barely hear you. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, we we if you don't want your presence to be known, uh, turn off your mic and don't and your camera and don't respond and your but your presence will still be recorded. So, but we hope you don't mind because this video will be made public. Should we start, Lama? I guess so. The Heart of the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra, Arya Bhagavati Prajna Paramita Hridaya Sutra. I prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem. Thus did I hear at one time. The Bhagavan was dwelling on the mass of vultures, mountain on Rajagriha, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagavan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Aryavalokiteshvara looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then, through the power of Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Aryavalokiteshvara, how should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Aryavalokiteshvara said this to the Venerable Shalabhati Putra. Shaliputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty, emptiness is form, Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness, without characteristics, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, 
no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomenon. There is no eye element, and so on, and up to and including no mind element, and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, and up to and including no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly, completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment and reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as the truth, since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared, Tayata gate gate paragate parasangate bodhi soha. Tayata gate gate paragate parasangate bodhi soha. Shariputra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from that concentration and commended the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Aryavada Kiteshvara, saying, Well said, well said, son of the lineage. It is like that. It is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom, just as you have indicated. Even the Tathagatas rejoice. The Bhagavan having thus spoken, the Venerable Shadadvati Putra, the Bodhi Mahasat Bodhisattva Mahasattva Aryavada Kiteshvara, those surrounding in their entirety, along with the world of gods, humans, Shodas, and Kandarvas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagavan. My apologies for, I edited the other text, but didn't edit this one. To fulfill the needs of all beings at their various levels of understanding, we request that you turn the wheel of Dharma, including the lesser and greater, common and extraordinary approaches. Okay. Thank you for being here. Uh, so... Can people hear me okay? All right, good. So we're continuing um, discussion of Uttara Tantra Shastra on uh, Tathagata Garbha, Buddha nature. So um, this Shastra should be um, your, um, the Dharma feel good. <laughs> so uh, it's elucidating all the positive qualities of uh, our awake nature, nature of mind, nature of our experience. So, um, <clears throat> but even though it's it's extremely positive, there are some uh, difficult passages, and the language is different. Uh, it's not uh, the usual kind of uh, psychological or social language we're used to. So that's why usually this text is um, given a. a a commentary and an introduction by one's uh, personal teacher. <clears throat> uh, one of the uh, commentaries I'm using, um, in addition to the ones in, in the book we already have by uh, uh, Jump and Control and Campus um, Soltream, is a, uh, 
actually a PhD dissertation that Lama Shenpin uh, from, from uh, Britain um, published as a, uh, just called um, The Buddha Within. So can people see? <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> uh, she's now uh, um, a Lama teaching in, uh, in Britain. <clears throat> One of the first people to do an online program. I've never met her, but um, I'm on my third reading of this book um, over the last 20 years. So it's always good to talk about what your sources are and where you're getting commentaries. Um, I'd like to read a poem that uh, is at the beginning of the book by um, Kempo Sotrin, who you know I've actually met and practiced with. <clears throat> so this is called uh, Yogan Kempo uh, Sotrin Gamso's Spontaneous Verses on the subject of Rantong and Shentong. So uh, people might remember or might not. These are uh, distinctions that were made in uh, Tibet to try to come to terms with the different ways um, we, uh, I could say we, because it's we, we understand uh, emptiness and uh, nature of phenomena, nature of mind. So uh, I'll read out the poem uh, and hopefully this will make some sense. Okay. <clears throat> when meditating on the profound emptiness, all one's difficulty is self-empty. And the sky-like self-emptiness make no effort to stop or to accomplish anything. If one knows how to rest within the clear light, all the virtues are spontaneously existent in the spontaneous primordial purity undue conceptual effort. Because apparent existence is self-empty, there are no illusions to stop. Because the ultimate emptiness of other exists, there is no spontaneous existence to accomplish. Beyond stopping and accomplishing, ah la la, the manifest world of samsara and nirvana, all such appearances occur, yet they occur in the open expanse of the clear light. Although they proliferate, they proliferate in the expanse of openness. So if one does not cling, their dissolution is exposed. If one knows the mind's true condition to be the clear light nature and the manner of the adventitious stains to be empty, then effortlessly equal love for self and others arises. By the power of the clear light, sun shining in the heart, may the darkness of conceptual thought fade into the expanse of openness. So uh, this was, uh, says Kempo Sotrin spontaneously composed these virtues, verses in reply to questions put to him in Oxford, March, 1989. So uh, Kempo Sotrin was, um, uh, particularly known for uh, giving replies um, to uh, questions um, in a song poem, just like Mila Repa was, like that. So um, maybe some people would like uh, a copy of this uh, spontaneous verse, um, and maybe we could make that available somehow. <clears throat> Trungpa Roche used to have uh, uh, these kind of things with, which would ask you for spontaneous uh, poetry. Uh, and uh, my own teachers would uh, just sometimes stop a lecture and ask me, like, how would you express the ultimate and the relative views? So um, uh, when I sometimes put people on the spot, uh, I am acting within tradition, but uh, now, uh, at least, uh, it, it's harder when uh, people are on the video, right? <laughs> but it's quite nice and quite interesting to see someone just kind of sing a song or do poetry uh, spontaneously like that. Um, uh, Allen Ginsberg, when he was at Naropa, um, uh, would do that kind of thing. 
and uh, also, you know, I'm in possession of a poem that uh, Allen Ginsberg spontaneously wrote for me. So that's a nice uh, uh, keepsake to have. <clears throat> so the world of poetry and song uh, is very close um, and not far from also uh, one's experiential realization and our philosophic realization too. So uh, in the West, uh, traditionally, they've been all separated, right? Different departments, uh, different buildings, something like that. So uh, in the uh, unbroken tradition, uh, poetry and song, experiential realization and scholarship uh, are all um, uh, together. Uh, that's, that's the way I'd like to do it and like to do it here um, at Lions or Dharma Center. Do you think that's a good idea to keep it that way? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so um, the COVID uh, world has uh, thrown me off a little bit uh, for the Buddha Dharma Study Program because uh, the uh, the way I want to do the it for those people that are doing the complete program is when you write your essay. Um, I want you to come in to Darshan and uh, talk about it, you see. Uh, I don't really want to just um, write kind of a, um, a grade um, the uh, uh, text and just hand it back. So we've done that in the past, but I, I want um, people to come and in a formal interview, uh, you know, I'll go over the text and then I can do it orally. So for example, um, for the attendants, like um, I'm just gonna call you out and say next time um, you come to Darshan. Uh, so uh, Ellen, please be ready to defend your essay on the tenants, okay? Where did she go? Somewhere, she is here, right? And then, uh, Dirk will have to do it <laughs> over the phone or video, okay? And then um, uh, Patty, uh, so come to Darshan and uh, defend. And uh, then Morris, uh, you'll have to do it then also, come to Darshan. And um, uh, Connor will have to and uh, Matthew Cruz and uh, Brad. I don't know if Brad's here today, Brad Yerkin. So I'm in defend. And um, <clears throat> Zima, so now, now you're safe to come in and visit, right? So, and, uh, and Jack, I'll have to talk on the phone also. And um, James, so um, this this is doing uh, the, the correct way. Is um, I know some people uh, can't see in person, but we can do the video on the phone, and then we actually have a dialogue. So uh, you you have to uh, review what you've said, perhaps, um, and I'll have a copy in front of me and you'll have a copy and then we can uh, uh, have an actual encounter about the tenants. So I'm trying to be, um, do it traditionally um, so that uh, the it isn't just an academic program uh, so that people's uh, scholarship and uh, personal uh, world and uh, lived experience all come together. Uh, that's one reason why um, this style, uh, you know, for people that are new, um, is not the usual style in America. Usually, it's very academic, and you're just listening and um, not having to um, talk about or defend your uh, position in front of a teacher. Um, but one of the reasons why we have um, uh, an A-list of teachers. Uh, such as uh, Arjun Rinpoche and Kansu Rinpoche and uh, Kenshin Rinpoche and um, 
you know, all the teachers that are coming. Uh, uh, and of course, uh, we, we hope to see uh, Geshe Sewan, uh, these Rinpoche's and uh, Laurent Geshe's, who are also nice people, by the way, is because they know I'm really trying to do it the traditional way and not divorce it from someone's uh, personal experience. So this is um, uh, really gratified that we still have enough people that are willing to do the essays and show up. So, uh, so uh, next time we have uh, Darshan, then uh, we'll be going over this, the people that have turned in essays. Okay, deal? Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> so, um, so when we're uh, talking about the uh, tenants or talking about the guardian or talking about now about uh, Maitreya's uh, Shastra, uh, personally, um, it's not, uh, uh, don't have your college hat on, right? Don't have your like, okay, now I have to get the right grade and not look stupid, right? You want to bring your experiential uh, world uh, that the scholarship world supports, right? So, uh, what the scholarship world study supports is um, an actual confidence uh, how things must be. So, uh, must be is kind of, uh, you know, based on logic and reason uh, from that point of view. So we have that certain kind of confidence. So if somebody says, uh, go to a store and uh, get these list of things or get five apples and get two pounds of this, we actually can get the exact number. So we're not just going because we're hungry or we like the taste, the experiential side. We're also bringing back you know, a certain kind of number. The other reason for doing the um, scholarship piece is that uh, if we don't have a certain amount of certainty uh, intellectually uh, and logically, uh, this the kind of um, the, uh, <laughs> the intellectual Maras, uh, the Maras that are very intellectual, will um, then come around and start doubting again. So uh, this happens uh, naturally um, anyway after uh, insights or after realizations, sometimes after experiences where our, uh, our inner doubter uh, will come and say, you know, that's, that's silly or you don't know what you're saying. Um, and if we don't know how to reply, then uh, even the most profound experiences uh, can be um, undercut and uh, dismissed. So everyone that's listening, uh, you've all had profound experiences of uh, aliveness and opening and um, being free and happy. But uh, then uh, some, what some people call the inner critic um, will come up and, and say something like, uh, you can't or that's not true or, you know, and uh, a lot of that inner critic um, is not only uh, contained uh, by the use of scholarship, but uh, is also, then we know how to debate with it uh, after uh, an experiential uh, approach too. So we are very lucky that we have the um, autobiographical, um, uh, transparent uh, teachings that uh, Siddhartha, uh, uh, the Buddha, uh, said to us that uh, he had uh, these profound experience of um, uh, seeing all uh, beings as being uh, the Tathagata Garbha, the Buddha nature. But then, uh, you know, uh, he, he was challenged by Mara as not being worthy, right? So he had to um, respond. So I'm fond of pointing this out. So that's very, before his full, I'm sorry, before his full alignment experience, he, you know, had that challenge and he had to touch the earth. But after his awakening, 
it is also challenged by, um, you know, maybe it'll be a drag to teach. Nobody's going to get this, right? So, uh, you know, fortunately he had developed himself so he could realize there were people that could understand and he could formulate the teachings in a uh, acceptable and uh, teachable way. So the uh, scholarship he did, plus the experiential wisdom, allowed him to overcome, uh, you know, obstacles that were both intellectual and experiential. So we have to deal with the both sides, right? So uh, I don't know if any teachers that were that have been that I've met that haven't also um, been profound scholars. They may not have memorized uh, the Abhidharma Kosha or something like that. But uh, actually, we had a te I know one teacher that did very profound. But they uh, they've done vast amount of study, and and one of those, of course, was. Um, Campus Holter and Ganso. So, <clears throat> also before I talk a little bit more, um, uh, uh, we'll be sending out a uh, announcement about uh, uh, a short one-day um, retreat practice at Lotus View on April eighteenth. That's a um, that's a Sunday. Uh, we haven't set that out yet, have we? No. <laughs> so I'm scooping our um, our email service here. So uh, we're going to go over uh, the same text we did in the past, uh, the Ganges Mahamudra, the um, flight of the Garuda, Shabkar and Pataramshe's commentary on the three points. But um, I would also like uh, to add a very um, uh, famous text. Um, it's called the uh, Aspiration of the Mahamudra of Definitive Meaning by the Third Karmapa. Um, the very famous text, very concise. Uh, and uh, uh, he also uh, like um, Mipam Ramshe uh, explains or puts forth his realization of how uh, Madhyamaka and Mahamudra and Dzogchen are getting at the same point. <clears throat> so I, I hope um, there can be you know some good attendance that day and then also hope for good weather. <laughs> so maybe we need some some naga practice, right? <clears throat> okay. Any any questions about what I've said so far? Simple. Heather Heather is raising hand. And you got to speak up, Heather, if you're going to raise your hand. Sorry, I couldn't find the button for a second. I was just asking if you could repeat the name of that text you'd like us to read before the retreat. Well, I didn't say read it before the retreat. <laughs> Should we get it for the retreat, though? Should we bring it to the retreat? Well, I, I'm i looking at about three different translations. Oh, okay. You'll let us know. That. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, as a... Uh, uh, several different translations are essentially the same, but um, uh, and uh, maybe Dark knows another translation by Lama Tony. Uh, we'll find out. I can't believe Lama Tony hasn't done a translation of the Aspiration Prayer of Mahamudra because it, it's so ubiquitous, but we'll see. He probably has because Pema Karpa is the third Karmapa, right? Is that right or am I wrong? Ranjan Dorje. Oh, Ranjan Dorje, that's right. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know. I'll look. I'll see. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the translations I've looked at are remarkably similar, but sometimes it's nice to um, be savvy about translations, right? So. <clears throat> What's difficult about um, Buddha Dharma in general? 
is that uh, the teachings and the realization are based on trying to um, uh, see through or um, liberate or extinguish uh, the idea of an Atman. So uh, the Buddha um, uh, refuted uh, the idea of an Atman, uh, a permanently existing um, individual self that uh, lies behind phenomena and uh, that is our primary identity. So uh, all of the teachings are trying to articulate uh, what that experience is and how we explain it without referring to uh, I, me, and mine, without trying to, without referring to uh, centralized self. Likewise, all the teachings are uh, also interested in how do phenomena arise? How did the world come into being without um, relying on uh, the concept uh, or the being of a creator God? So we have, uh, we're trying to articulate um, how things came to being without saying there was a being that brought them into being. And we're trying to talk about our experience without um, a centralized, fixated experiencer. This is difficult because it feels like we all our experience uh, comes back to some uh, central uh, point uh, that we usually identify as me. Isn't that so? <clears throat> At least we feel like there's some me that exists here that um, owns our experience or uh, has an experience or controls our experience or maybe doesn't control the experience or is the recipient of experience. But it comes back to some kind of uh, idea of uh, a self which uh, owns or experience or is the center of or controls. So uh, uh, Buddhism, Buddha Dharma uh, negates this, um, negates a uh, God, whether personal or impersonal, that creates the universe uh, and phenomena and um, even uh, negates how we normally perceive uh, other people and other objects too. So there's no reason why it shouldn't be really difficult to understand um, what this is all about. Because uh, we're normally always using uh, you know, our pronouns and talking about even my Buddha nature, right? <clears throat> So it's it's difficult um, to talk about experience when uh, really the experiencer uh, doesn't exist when there's no ownership. So in studying particularly this shastra, um, it would be easy to fall back into saying, well. That's all great. We get everything back now. <laughs> we get to have all these good qualities and we get to have this permanent self called Buddha nature, you know, and like, great, we're home free now. <laughs> so after all the uh, negation and changes and philosophic stuff, we're just back to like, okay, we're just trying to be good people. <clears throat> so part of the um, real struggle with the Shastra and within Buddha Dharma itself is how to articulate our experience without um, positing uh, even remotely um, a uh, final referent, a, a final self that uh, owns these experiences. So much of the history of Buddha Dharma is the articulation of different teachers and disagreements too. Um, sometimes quite heated uh, between teachers who say, well, now you're, you're, you're turning Buddha nature into a self or saying to other people, like now your emptiness is becoming nihilism. So how to find the middle way where we can talk about experience without 
uh, talking about a personal self that owns it, like that. <clears throat> So it's uh, difficult. Um, when I've worked with couples in couple therapy, um, which uh, takes extra work, uh, sometimes uh, I give them an exercise, um, which is uh, start talking to the other person without reference to them or to yourself. So uh, and it comes out sometimes kind of weirdly. So usually we'd say stuff like, I'm mad at you. So a couple would just have to say mad <laughs> on describe mad, but you can't say, uh, you can't say you or you can't say me like that. Uh, happy, you can't say I'm happy. You can't say, you'd have to say, you, it would have to be totally descriptive like that. Has anybody ever tried to do that kind of exercise? <laughs> it's really hard, okay? <clears throat> Actually, it's a good exercise too. Um, some of us in the past have taken nonviolent communication, which I recommend, but nonviolent communication still, um, you know, uses... Uh, subject object kind of language. Um, you know, are you willing to help me um, with the dishes? <laughs> or, you know, I'm noticing there's a lot of dishes uh, still in the sink. <clears throat> Would you be willing to help me do the dishes? You know, <laughs> but so there's still, uh, but what, what if you took off the I and the you? Dishes in the sink. Washing dishes. Going to bed happy. It almost sounds like a haiku, doesn't it? A little bit. <laughs> so uh, sometimes uh, I recommend that. And um, <clears throat> uh, that is good for Dharma students also, so that we um, don't always think like subject object. <clears throat> it's not that subject object by themselves are horrible, but we tend to reify and, and substantialize, I'm really in here and you're really out there. So uh, if we realize that they're just fluid and pointers and reference points, of course, sometimes we need to say, I'm going to the store. But uh, it might be useful dialogue with yourself, particularly in meditation, just to... Uh, not use the I or the you. So uh, one way that people uh, systematized uh, this kind of style of thinking um, is in what was called the Abhidharma, which is an attempt to categorize uh, all these descriptive states without um, using a personal self or some other person, such as God or other people. So at some point, uh, I'll give teachings on uh, Abhidharma and uh, like to give thanks to uh, Elizabeth Zima who's also done some research. And after a rigorous and painful uh, uh, mentorship for me, I might be willing to let her say something, you know? <laughs> be aware of what you ask for. <laughs> so Abhidharma is extremely difficult. So, uh, uh, they're, and, and kind of boring and weird. Um, so it's very attractive to me too, but it's particularly important that, um, uh, it, it be presented. Uh, otherwise it just becomes a taxonomy of, um, uh, mental states and, and states of mind and, uh, objects and so forth. Uh, so we, d we don't want to just hand out Abhidharma sheets like going to Kaiser. And then they hand out, you know, feelings, something like that, right? Wouldn't be very good if you went to a therapist and they said, well, I, look, here's the sheet on emotions. You decide which ones you want to use and then go home, you know, so uh, we wouldn't do it that way. <laughs> so uh, the 
uh, philosophy and the motivation behind Abhidharma um, uh, is something that I'll go to and uh, it might be a case, uh, you know, Elizabeth and I will do a little team teaching like this, right? We'll, uh, we'll keep an eye on each other, okay? Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> You already got a question. Oh, okay. I'm in a good mood tonight. So, but I only get one. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, it's nice to give other people a chance, but no one else raised their hand that I saw. Okay. So, sure. Yeah. I was just going to say, can you, for the Abhidharma categories, would making an icon or some sort of um, image representation of the categories be helpful? Uh, the mental states and whatnot, just like a visual maybe, representation. Yeah, you know, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, I like that. Okay. Um, uh, really, we haven't, you know, uh, kind of a digression, but maybe not. Is that Abhidharma is primarily something that is early and late Hinayana practice and. Um, Quasi Mahayana too. Um, so uh, one of the reasons why we have all these categories that are kind of refuted in the Heart Sutra is that uh, basically uh, Abhidharma texts you know, stopped being written because mm -hmm. uh, in the Mahayana and Tantrayana point of view, uh, they um, became kind of uh, irrelevant and true to be. Although it's still steady, we study everything. So, um, but uh, Abhidharma is kind of like um, a flat map, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, there's some there's I like maps, right? So um, they they have a lot of use, but the tendency is to confuse the map and the territory. Sure, I just thought it might be easy to learn yeah. it that way. Well, we'll talk. You know, you're very <laughs> visual, so so maybe there's. Uh, maybe that would be a breakthrough in, in Buddhism, like a, a visual Abhidharma. Mm -hmm. and like a, we have, we have that a little bit. There's kind of like with the, um, the descriptions of continents and Mount Meru. Mm -hmm. Those are sometimes visualized, you know, like we that. We could make an Abhidharma, Abhidharma infographic. Yeah. Okay, we'll get there. All right. <laughs> Any other? <laughs> yes. You're on. Uh, well, you know, what you're saying is for many years uh, before I had some kind of something happen where I just started understanding, uh, like it, reading Buddhist texts to me just seemed like it was completely, I had no idea what they were talking about, uh, which meant that I kind of understood because I had no idea what they were talking about. I didn't think I knew what they were talking about. But uh, anyway, uh, would you would you address the uh, relationship? You know, you brought up, you mentioned, you know, Atman. Mentioned the self, you mentioned the creator God, but what, what about the soul? <clears throat> okay, that's a good question. Um, so souls kind of our translation of Greek psyche, right? Um, or like Latin anima. Um, and uh, I th think, I, th I believe uh, there is a place for a psyche and there is a place for psyche in Buddhism. So we're not negating uh, the world of thoughts and feelings and memories and emotions and how those uh, are uh, work together in a coherent way. Um, we're uh, you know, very much interested in uh, soul in, this, in the way some um, post-Jungians uh, you know, talk about soul as, as being uh, the world being full of life and the universe as alive and uh, our uh, emotions and mind and perceptions in the world as being interactive. So uh, there's a lot of soul uh, and psyche in, uh, particularly in uh, Vajrayana Buddhism, right? Um, 
So uh, we have to do a lot of imaginal work. There's a lot of dream work. There's a lot of emphasis on memory and personal experience, right? So that all is um, what people like Thomas More or uh, James Hillman or, you know, uh, you know, post Jungians like that would, um, uh, you know, describe as soul. So um, <clears throat> we're uh, not negating that. Uh, and in fact, there's, uh, if, if we read the Shastra correctly, uh, we should be reading it as kind of soul material like that. Um, so uh, what, is, what is the Buddhist preoccupation with negating an Atman and saying that's not a true identity? So to uh, get at that, we have to kind of get inside um, uh, a little bit Indian philosophy and uh, understand like uh, why uh, the Buddha kind of, you know, went after the Atman and uh, why truth functions and uh, ideas about being and not being, you know, are so important. And uh, why also that maybe this language is kind of archaic and uh, has, has its own kind of rules and maybe uh, we have to continually uh, reinterpret it. Um, the idea of a self, I like to talk about as the idea of identity. So, uh, because, uh, uh, that that's goes for me deeper than just saying you know I'm me. So how do we how do we make the me? How do we create that like sense of that's me as separate from other things? So one of the traditional ways is um, you know like uh, when when people are we're in a crowd and someone's calling out our name. How, how is it that we instinctively, then after a while we feel, well, that's me they're calling. And how, how is it when we're insulted, we have a special kind of sense of identity or when there's a fear or, or heavy duty desire or something like that. So uh, most people wouldn't say, well, I feel myself at that point. We feel a sense of identity, which is a strange sense of, um, uh, distinction and um, reference point that suddenly appears uh, from the field of uh, experience. So out of all the experience we're having, why do we uh, sometimes contract to a point where we say this, this experience is an identity experience rather than, uh, than having a regular experience? So why, how and how are we able to form that sense of identity? The Buddha said that uh, the problem is that we uh, form that sense of identity unconsciously. Um, uh, that's kind of a psycho, psychological term, but ignorantly, you know, and unconsciously uh, where we form it and then we forget we formed it. So that uh, a sense of, uh, misidentity uh, arises uh, all the time, and identity arises when we don't have to have it arise. So uh, it's not just that. Um, so from the Shastra point of view, uh, this one we're studying, um, we say, okay, Buddha and nature, our Tathagatagarbha, our fundamental reality is uh, permanent and chainless, chainless and blissful and um, self, right? So how, can, how is that not an Atman, right? Sounds like one, right? Well, Maitreya or Sung would say, yes, 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 um, but um, it isn't an identity. We don't own it. So in the Indian Buddhist idea is that an identity has to be something you own, something that cannot, uh, you can't be deprived of. 
uh, and you own it and uh, it's different than others. So we could make a distinction. That's my identity and your identity. So it's not just a sense of self um, as a reference point. It, it, it goes deeper and uh, it has this funny uh, sense that uh, we're an identity that um, uh, has unique features that could exist on its own and must exist on its own and must be an identity, kind of an individual. It's difficult to explain, which is why um, we have a lot of philosophy and uh, it has to arise and be pointed out in the midst of our experience. So that's one reason that we need to be around other people um, to have uh, and to meditate to be with ourselves, to uh, catch ourselves in the act of being ourselves. In other words, in the act of believing and asserting our identity. And we have to be around people who are willing to say, there, that's it, right there, uh, so that we can view it. <clears throat> Mama, I have to respectfully submit that what you've done is bracketed the 2,000 years of the use of the word soul with pre-Christian and post-Christian interpretations. And so I, I ask, have to refine my question, which I didn't ask yeah. very well, but how does the Atman compare to the Christian idea of the soul? Oh, okay. Hmm. Really, which is really the primary use of the word soul in English language, right? Right. Um, uh, I think it's really doesn't feel that much different, except that um, generally in uh, conventional Christianity, rather than esoteric, you, you couldn't identify Atman with the center or God. So that would be heresy, right? The Atman would always have to be, you know, the, the Christian soul always has to be a created. Um, kind of entity that could also be extinguished. Um, and, uh, you know, with the Upanishads and, and further refinement of Advaita, the, um, the identity of the Atman and Brahman or uh, the Absolute becomes, you know, more and more pronounced, right? Um, yeah, so the Christian idea of, of soul um, would be, you know, still very uh, created and uh, uh, tentative in that way. But I think due to the influence of Plato and um, the attempt of Christianity to uh, explain itself to the Hellenistic world, uh, it took on a lot of the aspects of uh, an Atman type of thing. So uh, that's why I, I say to people sometimes here in the Sangha, like, um, we're not Buddhists, we're Advaita Vedantists, let's admit it, you know, <laughs> like that. Um, of course, the other uh, big difference is um, at some point, maybe with Council of Nicaea or something, um, the idea of uh, transmigration or souls having another life was was kind of banished. And I, um, uh, that the idea of transmigration um, is, is almost a given in, uh, in Indian philosophy, Buddhist and, and, uh, and otherwise. But for all intents and purposes, there's, uh, you know, people are saying my soul is my essence and not my identity. And um, uh, it, it doesn't seem different than Atman functionally. What do you think? Well, that's, that's what I think. But yeah. but still, I liked your profound uh, dissertation on 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 the on the more you know classical interpretations of psyche, and mm -hmm. and the way you uh, brought it into that unconscious uh, uh, experience of me, of myself. Yeah. Thank you. I think, <laughs> yeah, sure. I you know, uh, think about these things. So. 
I think for most people, the idea of soul remains, um, uh, you know, particularly kind of emotional and faith-based on Christianity. Um, the medieval scholastics, you know, uh, and some Christian-based philosophers tried to, you know, really bring an intellectual element in it, uh, particularly Thomas Aquinas, right? Um, but there's still, you know, very much uh, a non-intellectual feel, uh, a non-cognitive feel in a way, um, uh, where, you know, uh, and, and philosophic presentation of uh, Hindu belief, you know, it, it has a strong cognitive piece, doesn't it? So, um, <clears throat> and of course, Advaita Vedanta looks a lot like Buddhism, and Buddhism looks a lot like Advaita Vedanta. Um, so sometimes when uh, uh, I'm talking to people, I'll say, you know, um, who's doing all this? Uh, sometimes in darshan and um, unwittingly, or just because we have nothing else to say, uh, we'll say me. <laughs> and, then, and then you point here, maybe you point here. I don't know, me. Where's your me anyway? You know, uh, yeah, <laughs> talk to the hand. So um, that's um, uh, not an acceptable answer. You will not pass with that answer. So uh, if yeah, you know, because that's just asserting your identity, right? Like that. So um, we have to come up with something else. But if it, if you just don't say me, and uh, me and your history, okay? So then then what's there? So that's what why I hope to do. You know, darshan with some of the scholars here, <clears throat> but it has a practical application, because all dharma is practical, is that if we're continually asserting our identity, we're not really available to others in the rest of the world. If we're continually asserting our identity, actually we become very lonely, and uh, our identity uh, uh, has to grow bigger just to survive. So ironically, those with uh, the grandiose inflated anxiety uh, uh, sense of self, uh, people that we could easily name but don't have to, um, it's hollow, right? So uh, this is uh, one of the original translations or uh, denotations of shunya, empty. So uh, the Buddha wasn't always there, uh, I wasn't always saying that things didn't exist. He just said, well, your idea of Atman is hollow. It's, you've got this kind of a big bubble and it's very, <laughs> it's very thin and uh, it's hollow inside. It, it doesn't uh, exist as a solid thing. It's Shunya, <clears throat> it's empty. <clears throat> So uh, uh, would we be okay having a discussion with somebody on uh, this? Is, I'm really having, I'm happy to have a discussion with you and I want to validate you. Um, and by the way, I think you're really hollow. <laughs> um, or I'm really having, willing to talk to you about building a house or washing the dishes or being more present emotionally. But I just want to recognize that I, I really think you know you're you're kind of hollow like uh, a gourd that has nothing in it and you're incredibly superficial. But at the same time, since that's all you are, I, I'm glad to have that relationship with you. But would that feel okay? <laughs> Lama, isn't Atman um, a kind of consciousness that, um, if if I'm not mistaken, some people talk about that once. One sees, um, um, one's eyes see, Atman looks out from from us, theoretically. Um, so this Atman becomes like a solid thing, like a godhead, a, a kind of consciousness, a viewpoint, which is different from, obviously different from, from Shunyata. Uh. 
Um, you don't see where I'm going here. Not really. <laughs> well, that's, I, we, got, that's, yeah, we got viewpoint consciousness and Shinya. That's so, that, 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 um, in, in, my, in my understanding, which may not be very good, the Atman is a solid thing. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, a God viewpoint, which I can um, subscribe to. I can see the world through through God's eyes. So it's like a solid, solid in that way. Where where emptiness has no, there's no consciousness or no viewpoint of emptiness, per se. Um. I'm not doing any better. Some people say that that would probably be a nihilistic position. Mm. So, uh, somewhat nihilistic, a little bit, not not quite <laughs> mind So, uh, uh, particularly from uh, this third turning of the wheel, of course, emptiness and clear light nature of the mind would be synonymous. Yeah. Okay, which also means that, that that clear light, you know, according to the shastra, or the, or the, or the, uh, clear light and knowledge are the same are are the same thing. Uh, some kind of profound knowledge, yeah. Okay. But um, uh, you know, uh, you, in, in the Karmapas. Uh, Mahamudra, the poem of the Lord from the retreat, uh, there's a line where he says, we, we take this awareness to be a self. So, and mistakenly take awareness with a capital A, like uh, to be a self. So uh, what, what we're doing there is um, making the awareness uh, something that we own. We're, we're making an identity. So uh, what what the the Buddhists in India and Tibet were, and we are trying to do is uh, we have to find exactly uh, what it is to be refuted because uh, if we say a certain thing doesn't exist uh, or exists uh, as an illusion, we have to be really clear of what we're talking about. So, so much of the Shastra and so much of Buddhist philosophy, uh, when we say there's no Atman, we then have to define uh, what Atman is from our point of view, right? Which may be different than the Hindu point of view, okay? Uh, but we have to say, well, this is what we're saying it's not. This, this we never were able to find. So from Indian philosophy uh, and Buddhist philosophy, you have to, if something... Uh, is an identity, you would be able to find it, okay? So we're not just refuting it philosophically, like it has it has problems uh, logically and problems uh, like that. The biggest problem is you can't find it. So uh, there's analytical, um, logical ways of saying, well, it, if it's got to be somewhere in the mind and body or, you know, so we do a fourfold kind of a pasa thing, which I'll go over with people. But uh, the yogic part is, um, if, if it was there, you should be able to find it. It should be able to be defined. And, and then uh, when we can't find it, when we find that uh, the problems only exist uh, superficially and all we can find is Buddha nature, then uh, we're convinced that uh, the separate self doesn't exist the way we think it does. So in this third turning of the wheel, uh, we're assuming that we've already read the foundational Buddhism and the Prajna Paramita, and we've worked through everything uh, it isn't. And now uh, we verify that through meditation, and then we also verify uh, through scholarship, but most importantly, through our experience, like these Buddha gunas, these gunas, these qualities are actually there, but they're not there as a self. And they're not owned as a self. Okay. So 
is it okay to have it all and to be it all, but uh, you don't own any of it? Is that okay? Would that be okay with people saying, um, you can't, you know, can't claim that you've. Uh, it's not. A, it's not a personal it's, self. Well, it's not even a transpersonal self. You don't own it. No one owns it. Is that okay? No, no one owns anything. Do we have to own anything? Is it, is it important to own it? Would it be, would it be okay to just share it? Would it be okay to say, well, uh, everyone's got the same amount of Buddha nature. So this should be an easy question. How many people vote that everybody has exactly the same amount of Buddha nature? Raise your hand. Everybody that thinks Buddha nature, some people have more than others, like the force, you know, like Star Star Wars. Some people have more of the force than others. Anybody? <laughs> okay, so you're both uh, good scholars and practitioners. Don't you find that really kind of outrageous and annoying? A little bit to our sense of uh, personal uh, achievement. Don't you think that's a little annoying? Like some people, we could say, well, it's really great. Some people realize it um, or not. But um, I'm very fond of the question that um, Kenshin Rimshay brought up uh, several months ago. Like, okay, well, after enlightenment, realizing emptiness, really what good is it? So that's, a, <laughs> so that's a good question. So uh, that would be a question I'd like to ask people in an interview. Like, okay, so you, you get enlightened, awake, whatever you like to call it. Um, and would, would it be okay if um, absolutely nothing changed? What should change, right? So what, what kind of changes would you expect to see? Would it be okay if you got enlightened and like the Buddha, um, at first people said, I don't, you don't look enlightened to me. First person he met on the road to the deer park said, you know, well, who are you? And Buddha said, well, I'm the Buddha. And the merchant, whoever was, said, whatever. And his companions, the five ascetics, were initially very skeptical. Would it be okay if everybody thought you were still just a normal person? Would that be all right? So I think Patty was recently uh, uh, said that one of uh, Dujim Rinpoche's daughters passed away uh, recently and uh, she was described as hidden Dakini like that. So. Would it be okay if you were just a totally ordinary person and yet you had a profound view? Would that be okay? So we didn't own it like that. So it's very difficult um, to work with identity because at some point um, we, we do uh, psychologically, I believe, and buddhistically, we, we do want to kind of hold on to uh, our precious as what was the character and uh, what was his name? Golem. Golem, yeah. You know, my precious, right? You're holding on to my precious. Uh, would, would it be okay? So uh, when I was studying with um, uh, Sasaki Roshi uh, in um, Los Angeles, uh, he had um, uh, to well-trained monks come from Yoshinji in Japan. Um, and uh, they of course had their monastic names and, um, and the first public uh, ceremony uh, introducing them, uh, Suzaki Roshi said, uh, I'd like you to introduce you to our two new monks. This is monk one and monk two. <laughs> That's it. So everyone just called them, you know, I know, you know, whatever, Ichi, and you know, it's like, like, 
most people didn't know any Japanese, so we thought, well, that's their name. And it was just monk one and monk two. <laughs> Would that be okay? You know, how about it if, you know, you know, people called you by your wrong name consistently? Would, you know, would that be okay too? So that's a typical thing teachers do. Um, they call you by their, your wrong name like that forever. <laughs> and then uh, would that be okay? So uh, there's a big emotional attachment to who we think we are, even if we think our self is empty or we think it's enlightened, we still have this sense of identity, which is very tricky. One last question, because it's a little after eight, and I um, don't want to keep you too long. You know, Karen's okay, been uh, sitting patiently. Oh, very good. OK. Karen always has good questions, so I'm ready. Uh, well, I'm not sure I know how to ask this correctly, but um, I, I mean, I get, I get it about the, the, the negating the self, and it seems to be more of an internal thing. Um, although when you, the, the Prajnaparamita Sutra says feeling, meaning also like physical feeling, right? Not just emotional feeling. Um, but it's pretty hard when I think about my physical body, I think that I own it because if somebody hits me with a stick, you know, you know, Dirk's not being hit with a, a stick, but, but I am. And so then I grab on to the me there, you know, just even around physical body and, and my experiences that way, you know, and although it's easier for me to let go more of the, the you know, um, psychological parts is easier almost, but then mm -hmm. I get to the body part and I don't know what to do with it. Yeah, so that's a good question. So that's why um, uh, we do Tantra. So um how it works out in practice whether we're doing sutra yana work or uh, tantrayana or even mahamudra Dzogchen, there's there's always a dialectic going on so um we're asked to uh hold up our conventional sense of self uh it's kind of metaphorically holding up but to see our conventional sense of self simultaneously with uh the lack of conventional self-experience. So uh, the hard part about actually doing um, uh, authentic Dharma practice is we have to experience the simultaneity of both uh, doing it uh, so-called right and wrong at the same time. So we're the, then the mind can see the contrast and uh, integrate the two experiences. So uh, actually, um, one of the most famous Zen masters in China, um, who was a sutra master, but started having problems just with the intellectual study, um, you know, said, eventually found his master, I don't know who it was, Joshu or someone like that, and said, all the sutras, like, it parts and part of me to say, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body. And he says, but I've got a problem. I have an eye, I have a nose, <laughs> I have a tongue, I have a body. You know, what do I do with that? And it's at that point that um, he really started doing, you know, authentic practice um, because he was able to uh, hold the, the, those contradictory um, experiences and intellectual experiences at the same time. So uh, the real practice is we develop uh, enough of a, a interest in this kind of uh, dynamic, which isn't, uh, it's not quite Hegelian, but it has that kind of feel of synthesis, antithesis, you know, you know, thesis, antithesis, synthesis feel to it. Uh, but um, it happens experientially that we're uh, made to uh, confront um, the strong sense of self and a strong sense of the abandonment of the identity at the same time. So that's why in Tantra particularly, but uh, 
and Zen has a lot of Tantra in it from a Tantra <laughs> point of view. Is uh, it takes a lot of courage to have those uh, experiences happen simultaneously um, because we we we're right on the edge like that. So uh, teachers try to foster a strong sense of foundation, but then uh, bring uh, people right up to the edge. Not over the edge, but being the edge. So you're experiencing uh, both uh, states at the same time, like that. So uh, it's uh, that's one of the functions of Buddhist debate, too, is that you debate both sides. And the idea is that uh, if you see both sides at the same time, you're going to have a transformative uh, experience that when seen with wisdom can uh, be a realization like that. So it's very hard to get people to um, have the intense experience of identity and um, loss of identity at the same time, which is why uh, Buddhists traditionally would uh, spend a lot of time, tantric Buddhists, in um, and charnel ground, because then you're um, uh, you're with recently uh, uh, died bodies, corpses, and you're alive at the same time. So uh, you know these kind of extreme experiences um, sound kind of bizarre, but the, behind it is the um, uh, trying to juxtapose those two together. So that's why I put. Uh, so much emphasis on um, doing uh, the proper kind of shamatha so that we're uh, having a balanced shamatha, bringing into balance uh, uh, the different um, problems like anxiety or depression so that we're looking at them uh, evenly. Like So it's an even-minded uh, approach rather than just a memory approach as in the Hinayana, like that. So... <clears throat> So uh, it does feel when we're doing deep practice that we're being turned inside out um, or maybe going a little crazy. Um, but uh, uh, hopefully there's enough Sangha support. And by that time, one's developed some kind of confidence or um, faith in one's teacher that um, it's doable. <laughs> Long answer. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so uh, it is true. We we should be uh, reading these texts as kind of, uh, uh, this is really, you know, it should not make sense. Uh, if we're reading it early on and it all makes a lot of sense, uh, you're, you're probably uh, just kind of putting a veneer over it. It, it should be a bit of like, uh, you know, like I'm just told I, I don't, uh, my, body is empty of essence, that by itself the mind and body and experiences are unfindable. So if that's a problem, if that's so, then why am I having such a problem with them, right? Why am I said that they're not solid um, the way I experience them? Why is it that uh, the experience of solidity and the uh, permanent identity and uh, conflict seems so real, right? So, um, but the, when, if we're able to hold that question uh, hold that experience together with uh, uh, the transcendent side, uh, the paramita side, then um, uh, something very interesting happens. Yeah. Okay. Long, long answer. Is that is that good enough for now? Well, <laughs> it, it's difficult practice, you know, which is um, why uh, if you're, uh, you, you have to you have to partner up with people that are going to be both supportive and challenging at the same time, right? <laughs> you can't be around just challenging people, which would be just negating your permanent identity, and you can't just be around supportive people all the time. You have to kind of have that balance. So uh, hopefully, in the sangha here. We, uh, have that kind of balance. So the lucky people that um, have found their practice objects, <laughs> practice objects, and you, know, um, you you need to find that. Sometimes it's one of your cats or dogs that um, just won't obey you. You know, 
that's uh, the best kind of <laughs> practice object, right? You think you own the pet, but you don't, right? So uh, it's really nice to be, uh, that's why going out in the wilds and um, with Buddhists uh, um, practicing among really in the wild, you know, we don't have much wild left in the world anymore, but really practicing in the wild where, um, you know, nature or the animals uh, don't automatically have our, our best interests, where we're not the center of the universe, um, where we're not just in a park, but we're in a wild atmosphere. Um, you know, that's why traditionally yogis would practice in the jungle. It wasn't just to get out, out of the city. Um, but um, my teachers used to say, well, uh, particularly Suzaki Roshi said, well, uh, we don't have to go into the jungle because we're in South Central LA. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he was right. So uh, I have a lot of stories about that, but that'll have to wait. So you, you want to practice in the wild. So there's a nice book. Uh, I think Dana lent it to me, uh, Zogchen Pona Premche, it's something called uh, The Wild Mind or something like that. Isn't that right, Dana? She's still listening, I don't know, but uh, so uh, the nature of the wild. Yeah. I don't I don't remember that one. I know uh, that I, I remember telling you about the rebel Buddha. Yeah. That yeah, one. that that one's easy to remember, yeah. So we'll look <laughs> it up. Yeah, okay. thanks for speaking up. All right, we uh, some of us uh, and Dirk in particular uh, need to go to bed. So uh, we should close up here and I appreciate everyone's attention. Please enjoy your experience, even though it's not really your own. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, and Thank you, Lama. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, Lama. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel, Bodhicitta, that has not arisen, rise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chenrezig, Tenzin Jatso. Please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Bosan, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion. Manju Shri, master of flawless wisdom. Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras. Tsongkhapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages. Losangragpa, I make request at your holy feet. Thank you, Lama. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for doing the reading of the uh, Shastra a couple of days ago. Uh, thank you for doing Manjushri practice for my long life. So uh, we all need that loving wisdom. Uh, even though we don't own it, it's ours. <laughs> it's our the reading country. was fantastic. I think everybody did oh, a great good. job. And I think yeah. we all had a good experience, if I can speak yeah. to everybody. Yeah, I, I, I want to put that on the website. So we'll talk. Yeah. So see you all soon. Bye, New Mexico. Thank you, Bye, Pennsylvania. Hello. Bye, Washington. <laughs> Bye, Seattle. Bye, Kingston. You know. Bye, Sacramento. Bye, Carmichael. Bye, everybody. <laughs>